Hello everyone, I am Dibharati Das, I am a graduate student at McGill University and today I will be talking about modeling the behavior of selected water soluble elements in calcium sulfate veins of Gale Crater. Calcium sulfate is an evaporite and evaporites have been observed throughout the traverse of Gale Crater. You can see the traverse path of the Curiosity River in red on the black and white image and on its right side you can see an example of the calcium sulfate veins that the Curiosity rover sampled in Gale Crater. Evaporites form as a result of evaporating fluids and often end up storing information like temperature, pH, redox condition, and these are the properties that we want to know about Mars fluids, but we can't directly sample those, so evaporites are our next best options. Evaporites are extensively studied on Earth and often help us understand possibility of life in arid conditions, paleoclimate conditions, and enrichment behavior of water-soluble elements. So this active area of research on Mars is going to give us a more detailed insight into the last stages of liquid water that formed these calcium sulfate veins. Here is what we think is the journey of fluids that form these evaporites, which may have started from a perennial lake system. And once the source of water in a lake is cut off, it starts to dry out and starts forming crusts of evaporites in and around the lake bed. Without any external movement of water, the evaporites pretty much sit around the lake bed but they can be remobilized if a rain event takes place or if groundwater gets in contact with these evaporites. So this new source of water can dissolve the crusty evaporites from the lake beds and transport it elsewhere. For example, if groundwater comes in contact with these evaporites, it'll dissolve them, become more briny, and the entire groundwater network can move quite far away from the original area and redeposit the evaporites into cracks, crevices, and even bedding planes of nearby rock units. So evaporites have the ability to store information about whether a lake is drying or a late stage groundwater is drying. As brines will become more progressively enriched in water soluble elements, elements based on the condition of the water and on the surface condition. So whatever elemental fingerprint or combination of elements we are observing in an evaporite is going to be a broad representation of the circumstances it formed under. For example, if there is an influence of hydrothermal activity, it may show unusual concentrations of fluorine and lithium. If the brine is acidic, certain kinds of minerals may form like sasolite, which is a borate associated with low pH conditions. Now this may not be a one-to-one -one correlation and definitely not as straightforward, especially when it involves remobilization of evaporite forming fluids. But in case of Mars, the more environments we puzzle together, the higher the resolution of our understanding of the last stages of Martian fluids. On Earth, we see large deposits of evaporites in arid areas and we have some of the largest deposits as salt pans or salars in places like Chile, Bolivia, Argentina, the US, China, and Spain. These deposits are incredibly important because they are some of the major sources of elements like boron and lithium. Lithium is used for making batteries that power quite a lot of devices and even transportation modes. So a scarcity of an element like lithium is not ideal. And understanding the enrichment process of these water soluble elements is quite important also on Earth. But of course, studying these deposits also provides insight into Martian environments and these areas can act as good analogs for evaporative processes on Mars. So let's have a look at evaporites and possible brine environments in Gale Crater. Curiosity has frequently observed calcium sulfates in forms of veins and cements. An example of calcium sulfate veins can be seen in the image of the target area Salisbury Peak on the right side. 
Curiosity has also observed magnesium sulfates. William Rapin will be talking about these observations in the Curiosity mission results session, and the abstract number is 1479. Curiosity has also observed halides, and these observations are summarized by Thomas et al. in 2019. In addition to the rover, uh, in addition to these, the rover is about to drive up to the unit named the sulfate units. You can see the entire unit highlighted in yellow in the image below, and the rover's current position near this unit on the image on the left side. In terms of fluid environments, we can make inferences based on the presence of certain minerals or element enrichments. Lanza et al. will talk about the possible oxidizing environment based on the presence of manganese enrichment in this session. The abstract number is 2231. Fournier et al. and Gazda et al. talk about the possibility of hydrothermal activity. Fournier et al. will explain fluorine observations also in this session and the abstract number is 1503. Gazda et al. will also talk about the possibility of hydrothermal activity in the MSL Curiosity Mission Results session, and the abstract number is 1271. We've also observed the presence of minerals like acaganeite and jarosite, which indicate a possible acidic warm environment. Now, this is not an exhaustive list of observ observed evaporite phases and environments. And all these phases and environments may not even be linked to each other and may point towards multiple generations of fluid activity. This research, however, focuses on the study of boron and lithium of the calcium sulfate veins observed in Gale Crater because these two elements are highly water soluble and can improve the resolution of our understanding of the different environments we think are possible in Gale Crater. So we measured the relative concentrations of boron and lithium of calcium sulfate veins in Gale Crater and noticed that boron and lithium is broadly inversely correlated to each other. This plot is shown on the top right corner of the slide. The x-axis shows the relative boron concentration indicated by the peak area measured by the ChemCam instrument of the rover and the y-axis shows the lithium concentration measured in the veins. We can see that for lower values of boron, lithium concentrations are somewhat high, although this correlation isn't exact because there are points that don't quite fall on the trend line. A process that could explain an inverse correlation is sequential precipitation, where boron precipitates out as borates due to its lower solubility, and lithium stays in the brine because it is more soluble and then moves away from the precipitated borates. However, the story may be a little more complicated than just sequential evaporation with progressing dehydration, as the relationship between boron and lithium isn't an inverse correlation. The precipitation may be affected by adsorption of boron and lithium to surrounding clay-rich minerals, and also possibly multiple generations of dissolution and reprecipitation. Another problem comes up when we try to explain the concentration ranges of boron and lithium in the calcium sulfate veins of Gale Crater. The calcium sulfate veins show a boron range between 75 to 300 ppm and lithium range between 5 to 56 ppm, as shown in the table here in the middle. When we compare this to boron and lithium values of terrestrial basalts and natural waters, the Mars values are a lot higher. I've taken examples for Iceland in this case, and we can see that the boron values for basalt and natural waters do not exceed 12 ppm, and lithium maxes out at 23. So in case of Mars, we can't simply equilibrate water with basalt to form the boron and lithium ranges we observe on Mars. We need an evaporation process, maybe even two or three generations of evaporation. So that is basically what we tried. We tried to model evaporation of a possible Mars fluid composition using the software ChimXPT to see what it gives us. The Mars water composition we used is based on Gale Portage water established by Bridges et al. in 2015. This composition was modified and I added boron and lithium to the mix. 
the added boron and lithium composition is based on the Icelandic natural waters, although for this run, I chose to add four times more than Iceland waters to make sure that I got a boron and lithium phase as resultant. So this is a log log plot and it shows total water content on the x-axis and the resultant phase concentrations on the y-axis. As we go from right to left, water is exi exiting the system and we can see the resultant phase increasing in concentration. In this run, we got aqueous CaSO4, HCl, CaCl2, NaCl, and LiCl. We also see anions H2BO3 and BO2. These are borate ions, but we still don't see any boron-rich precipitates forming. Now, there may be two reasons for that. First reason is that we are still updating the Trim XPT modeling database with thermochemical information of different borates and lithium rich phases, so the possible resultants have just not shown up yet. The second reason is that even though I added boron and lithium, that is four times that of the Iceland compositions, it may still not be enough to precipitate borate phases. The important question is. Can we compare these values with Mars observations? Well, not really, at least not yet, because although we know the boron concentration of the sulfate veins, we don't know the cation attached to the boroid ion. Similarly, we don't know for sure which anion is attached to the lithium ion. For now, we can see that the boroid ion concentrations are within an order of magnitude of the observed boron concentration. But this comparison will make more sense once we start precipitating some borates in the model runs and then compare them with possible borates on Mars. As in, we assume a cation based on what is the most logical borate phase geologically and then do a comparison. I also plotted the modeled pH of the evaporating aqueous system. Here the x-axis is the total water content and the y-axis is pH. With decreasing water, the pH is decreasing, and with increasing temperature, the pH is decreasing except at 20 degrees centigrade. I'm not entirely sure how to explain this yet, but this is definitely an interesting observation. I also ran this evaporation setup on another possible evaporitic fluid to check if I'm actually precipitating any solid phases especially calcium sulfates. And I did precipitate some calcium sulfates, as you can see here, uh, labeled as gypsum. However, I have not yet incorporated any boron phases into this system yet. This is still a work in progress, and quite a lot of fine-tuning is going to be required before I can make a comparison with the observations from Gale Crater. But once the fine-tuned setup is complete, we can have a comparison between a geologically possible and thermodynamically stable system. So to summarize, evaporites are quite important for understanding the process of low temperature fluid evaporative environments on both Earth and Mars. In Gale Crater, boron and lithium in calcium sulfate veins show a broad inverse correlation, and this may be due to a combination of sequential evaporation, adsorption, and remobilization. Boron and lithium values in calcium sulfates of Gale Crater are high compared to that of terrestrial values, and this may be due to multiple generations of evaporation. We tried to model evaporation of the Mar Martian fluids using the software CHIMXPT, and the modeled boron and lithium concentrations so far may be within one magnitude of order compared to the observed boron and lithium in Gale Crater. However, the exact boid and lithium rich phases in Gale Crater are still unknown. We are still updating the Chim XPT software with thermodynamic data of boid and lithium rich phases, and this is a work in progress. But future model runs with an updated database will give us better comparison points. That is all I have for now. Thank you for coming along on this interplanetary brine journey.